Thank you all very much for coming to our first Europe on the Cheap Travel in Europe workshop of the semester. Uh, this is uh, one of three European travel workshops. They're all the same, but um, taking place throughout the next uh, month or so. Um, we're, before we begin with the actual content, um, all the presenters are going to introduce themselves. So I guess I just quickly introduce myself. Um, my travel experience um, consists of, well, I lived two years in Germany, and when I was in Germany, I traveled pretty much all around Western Europe. Um, I'm Allison. I am a peer advisor in the Education Abroad Office, and um, I studied abroad in Spain, and I also traveled around Spain, and then I traveled in England, Italy, and France as well. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. I'm the Peace Corps recruiter here at Michigan. Um, I studied abroad in Spain and Barcelona, and then also traveled all over Western Europe um, and Northern Africa. So. Uh, my name is Craig. I did study abroad in the Czech Republic and sort of traveled all around Western Europe. And then I did the Peace Corps in the Republic of Moldova. And so I've been sort of all over Eastern Europe and the Balkans as well. Hi, I'm Shosh. I work for SDA Travel as travel agent. Um, Europe travel experience, I've, I mean, not study abroad, but I've done extensive travel, backpacking tours, um, most of Western Europe, a little bit of Eastern Europe. Great. So if you are a U.S. citizen traveling for 90 days or less throughout um, most of the countries in Europe and you're traveling for tourist purposes, you probably are not going to need a visa or you don't need a visa. If you are traveling for purposes other than tourism, say maybe some of you are doing a summer internship in, in Europe or um, maybe you're going to be going for a conference or something like that, um, you need to think about whether you need a visa. And we can help you look into that. Um, you would find out visa information by looking at the embassy or consulate's website of the country that you're going to be going to. Um, if you're an international student, uh, you are going to need a visa to visit Europe. And if you have questions about that, again, we can point you in the right direction uh, if you come into the International Center's Education Abroad Office across the hall. Um, Moving right along to the travel registry. Oh, me. So, University of Michigan has a travel registry. You can um, access it on Wolverine, Ac or Wolverine Access. Um, and this is just a way to kind of, um, you know, keep make sure that all of the students are safe and they can get to you or contact you in case of an emergency, natural disaster, um, anything like that. Um, so you do need to register all of your travel. So, you know, obviously like where you're studying abroad or where your internship is or where you're traveling. But also if you do just take weekend trips, like let's say, you know, you're in Spain and you're going to, to France for the weekend, you, do, you should register that as well. Just because, you know, if something happens, you know, in Paris or wherever you are in France for the weekend, University of Michigan would be able to contact you or find you and make sure that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, um, I would also suggest just registering with the embassy as well. Um, the great thing about the embassy that if something happens at home and your parents can, can't get a hold of you, they can contact the embassy and the embassy can find you. So um, that's just kind of an additional kind of safety net um, of, you know, making sure that you're safe and know where you are can contact you if something happens. So. And just to clarify, that would be for um, U.S. citizens registering with the U.S. Embassy oh, yeah. in the country that you're going to be traveling to. If you're not a U.S. citizen, you can check with your home country's embassy to see if they have a similar registry. If it's not a U of M program, should you still register with U of M yeah. registry? We would highly recommend it. Um, it. It's honestly just for your own good. So the university has a senior advisor for international um, travel, health, safety, and security. Her name is Kim Coyne. And she regularly um, keeps track of everything that's going on around the world as far as like safety and security is concerned. And um, she looks into the university's travel registry to see if there are any of our students, faculty, and staff traveling to those regi regions, even if it's just for backpacking or visiting family or friends or something like that. And if she sees that someone is in one of those areas, she'll contact them and make sure you're okay and you know figure out what needs to be done if there is a, an urgent situation. So it's honestly only for your own good to, to register in the travel registry. All right, then we'll move on to health insurance. Um, after you register in the travel registry and Wolverine Access, the last step of that is going to prompt you to register for the HGH health insurance. Um, if you're going on a university-related trip, whether it's study abroad or any university-related travel, it's 
um, required. If you're not going on a U of M trip, it's still highly, highly recommended. Um, you should still get it. It's a dollar ten a day plus a five dollar one time registration fee. Um, it's really extensive coverage. When you once you're registered, you have access to a whole bunch of medical information on HGH's website. There's a list of English speaking doctors in your area, um, recommended doctors in your area, um, medicine translations, um, general health and safety tips. And if you are going on a university trip, you the duration of your stay will be included automatically, but if you're going to be traveling before or after, you can extend it. I mean, we recommend that you do that as well if you're just going to be like backpacking or traveling alone, um, not related to U of M. I was just going to say one, one thing about the health insurance. There are two main ways to use the health insurance, and this is kind of important to, to know about in case you do have an issue abroad. Um, if it's an emergency situation, say you fall into a ditch and you break your leg, you need to get to a clinic as soon as possible, you need to go to the nearest clinic. And it might be the case that you're going to have to pay up front for um, the, the, the cost of, of getting your leg fixed, for example, but then later on you can get reimbursed by the health insurance. <coughs> if it's not a super, super <coughs> urgent situation, then what you should do is contact HTH, which is the provider of the Travel Abroad Health Insurance, Either by telephone, they have a, a collect number that you can call from anywhere in the world and you will not get charged. Or if it's really not urgent, you can also send them an email. They do respond very quickly. If you do that, they will put you in touch with a hospital or clinic nearest you with English speaking doctors that has um, services that are up to a certain standard that you would go to. And in almost all cases, um, they would pay directly and you would not need to pay upfront for your services. So those are the, the two main ways. Uh, once you register for the, the health insurance, you will get some follow-up information from the health insurance provider, so you'll have all of that contact information, but that's just a general overview of how the health insurance works. It has literally saved the lives of U of M students, faculty, and staff before, and I'm not exaggerating, so uh, you should definitely, absolutely get it. Mm -hmm. um, for some of the programs, it says, like, in the program fee, it has a student. Is that separate? Are you referring to like a U of M program? Yeah. If it's a U of M program, then it would actually have it built in. So okay. there's a university policy that all University of Michigan uh, sponsored programs, uh, they require their students to, to get this insurance and most of them build it in. So. Um, and also, um, I was going to say if there's something happens in the country that you're in and you need to be, I guess, extracted for some reason, um, HGH is also the people you would contact about that. Mm -hmm. We would cover that too. Mm -hmm. And Kelly talked about that you can call or email to find the closest hospital. You can also just do that online. So like when I was traveling this summer, I just went online and found the closest hospital in like the main city I was staying and the doctors so that I just had that information if I didn't have internet access or like didn't have my phone or something happened, I at least had that information um, with me ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So. Good. All right, then I guess we'll move on to guidebooks. Um, all right, we have a bunch of guidebooks up here as examples, sort of. Um, there's Let's Go, Lonely Planet, Rick Steves. Um, of course, the internet is awesome as well. Um, one thing I would recommend when it comes to sort of finding out about different cities, um, countries, food, accommodations. Germany's next. romantic oh, road. The next me. one. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and just sort of anything you want is look for blogs of people who are living in countries or cities they might be traveling to and send them an email. Um, people love sort of expatriates, for example, love connecting with um, people who are traveling and showing you around and things like that. So I would definitely recommend that in addition to, to guidebooks. Um, the Education Broad Office, we have so many resources for Europe. Yeah, and a lot of our guidebooks are admittedly a little bit old, and we would always recommend trying to get a hold of the newest edition uh, just so that you know that the, the places that are listed in the guidebook probably still exist. Um, because, you know, things open and close, so uh, we wouldn't want you to look at an old guidebook and end up trying to find a hostel that closed a few years ago. Um, another reason why these sorts of guidebooks can be really useful is just for like things like figuring out how to find um, tickets for like the tram or like the bus. Um, Sometimes it's not clear that you have to go to like the tobacco shop to get the, the tickets. So that sort of information would be in the guidebooks. And then they also usually tell people or, or tell you like if there are certain parts of a city that you maybe shouldn't go to because it's maybe a little bit dangerous. 
So even though books are um, maybe a little old school, we would still recommend um, looking into a guidebook. And I just also wanted to make a quick plug. We just recently discovered that Rick Steves, who is a very famous um, travel, travel writer, uh, tour guide, who typically focuses mostly on Europe, um, he has a really great YouTube channel in, in which he has almost all of his videos um, traveling all over Europe. And he also has like travel tips for packing, for driving, for all sorts of things. So I would highly recommend looking at it. The link is on your agenda as well. The other thing with guidebooks, if you don't want to lug around a big guidebook, um, at least Lonely Planet, I don't know about all of them, but Lonely Planet, you can buy individual chapters online. If you're bringing like an iPad or an iPhone or some uh, tablet with you, then you can buy individual chapters or the whole book, so then you don't have to lug around a whole book and like work out pages when you're done with them, like people traditionally do with guidebooks. So that way you can just have it a bigger one with you the whole time, or just buy the chapters that's relevant to you, so you don't need to buy like the whole Europe book if you're only going to one place. Um, oh, ASA cards. Okay, so while you're traveling, um, your M card may or may not work abroad as proof that you're a student, just because people haven't seen it before. So one thing I would highly recommend is the International Student D card or the ISIC card. The card is $25 plus shipping, and it's valid for one year from the date of issue, and it's internationally recognized proof that you're a student. So anytime there's any student discount, uh, you can use that card, plus there are specific discounts that come with the card. So even here in the States, you get 15% off Amtrak and discounts on Target.com and software discounts, Macy's has discounts, so lots of great discounts that come with that. When you're abroad, some hostels will have free Wi-Fi if you have a NISA card, or free welcome drink with NISA card, or just completely different rates for that. So I'd highly recommend that. It's also a prepaid MasterCard. So then if you're looking for another um, form of uh, currency to bring with you while you're traveling, you can choose to add funds to it. If you don't add funds to it, you can still use it for all the same discounts and benefits, but you can also choose to add funds to it if you want. Um, and I can, if anyone has more questions about that, I can definitely answer that. All right, um, and after you're done with your study abroad experience, um, definitely stop by the Education Abroad Office for information about volunteer opportunities, work opportunities, teaching English abroad, um, either sort of in the country that you studied in or other countries in Europe or around the world. Um, there are short-term work opportunities in the UK, for example, um, work and travel in Ireland, and a bunch of volunteer programs like Volunteers for Peace, which allow you to sort of um, work and live inexpensively in Europe after you're done. Um, and those, like you said, you can, since you're already going to be in that country, you already paid your airfare if you just want to extend your trip a couple weeks and do some sort of volunteer project or something, that's a really great opportunity because you're already in the country. So, um, and so then you can move on to trip planning. I don't know if everyone here has heard of STA Travel before, but we're a full-service full student travel agency that specializes in student travel. Um, so we have lots of great products that are specifically for students. We have contracts with the airlines for reduced airfare. So sometimes it's cheaper flights, sometimes the flights have better terms and conditions. So refundable tickets, tickets that are it, it possible to change the return date if you do decide that you want to stay longer and extend your program or if you needed to return early for some reason. Um, we have a great program called the Airfare Deposit Program. This used to be only open for study abroad students, now it's open for all students who are traveling, whether it's a study abroad program or just traveling on your own. It's where you would pay a $300 deposit for your flight, and then the remaining balance for your ticket isn't due until seven days before travel. So it really allows you to break up the cost of the flights. Um, this flights you can find some cheap flights to Europe, however, it still is an added expense, and to be able to split up that payment and to uh, not have to pay all up front can definitely be a great way to help plan for your trip. Um, can also help with rail passes, with those ISA cards I was talking about before. If anyone's interested uh, before or after a study abroad program doing a tour or backpacking, so uh, either whether it's the a uh, full tour with other like-minded travelers, other people your age from around the world, or if you are looking to do it independently and stay in hostels and get a rail pass and everything like that, I can help you with all of that. Um, I have a sign-up sheet in the back, so if you did want me to send you over, we have uh, electronic brochures for Europe. So if you wanted me to send you over an electronic brochure, or if you wanted to be signed up for our weekly travel deals email, or if you have anything else you want help with, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table over there. Um, I would be happy to have, uh, help with that as well. Um, any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, so then the next thing would be packing, and the most important piece of advice I think anyone could give you is to pack light. Um, I am a terrible overpacker. 
every time I travel and you will not thank yourself for it when you get there. Um, so put everything that you think you're going to need out somewhere on your bed, in your room, and then cut it in half. You really aren't going to use nearly as much as you think you're going to. You're going to rewear a lot of stuff. Um, there's things that you use here that you just won't need there. They're just not as important as you think they are. Um, so when you're packing, really consider you know, the culture and the climate and the geography of the place that you're going. Um, in Europe, there's a lot of cobblestone streets, and you're not going to be wanting to be pulling around you know, a 50-pound rolling suitcase behind you. That It's not easy. It's not fun. Backpacks are definitely the way to go if you can get away with it. Um, and you know, you might think that the place that you're going is going to be really warm. If you're going to be in the mountains, it's going to be really cold. You really need to look at sort of the geography of the place that you're going, um, plan ahead. Um, another thing is you can bring one thing that will work in a lot of different ways. Like if you're going to be going to a lot of churches, for example, um, you need to keep in mind that you have to be dressed pretty conservatively. Girls, your shoulders have to be covered, covered down to your knees. Um, so for something like that, Scarves are really good. You can wrap them around your shoulders um, so you don't need to bring long sleeve things or you know, long sleeve dresses, things like that. Um, so try to bring items that are versatile. Um, and another thing is you're going to want to leave space for, to bring souvenirs back. You're going to buy stuff there. You're going to want to bring it back. So if you can, bring things that you're not really attached to, like shirts and pants that are really cheap that you can leave or throw away if you have to to make room for, to bring new things back with you because um, you'd rather do that obviously. Um, bring all the prescriptions that you're going to need for your trip with you um, for the whole duration. You're not going to want to have to worry about getting things filled or renewed while you're abroad. Um, this applies for like eye care. Bring all of your contacts, all of your contact solution. That stuff isn't always as easy to get in like a drugstore over the counter as it is here. Um, sometimes it requires a prescription and you don't want to have to worry about dealing with that while you're there. Um, adapters and converters. An adapter is the one that just changes the plug. The converter is the one that will actually change the voltage of the appliance. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially if you're going to be traveling with like your computer or electronics like that. You don't want to fry things. So make sure you look up the voltage of the place that you're going and verify that what you're going to be plugging in is going to still work. Um, Things like blow dryers and hair straighteners and curling irons, you don't need those. You can live without them. Don't take them. Um, if you absolutely need one, buy it there. You can get a blow dryer for like 10 euros. Um, do not use your American ones in the outlets. Even if you have the converter, it will probably still blow the fuse and still fry your appliance. Um, and then, yeah, that too. Um, and just some extras, things like a battery-operated alarm clock extra batteries, um, extra memory cards for your camera. You don't want to have to worry about losing one or breaking one and not being able to take pictures for the rest of your trip. Um, copies of all your important things. If you're studying abroad, have a copy of your acceptance letter, where you're going to be going, um, any of that stuff. Ziploc bags, the big gallon ones, you will use that so often for dirty clothes, wet clothes, um, bringing things back. When I came back, I brought like three big bottles of olive oil. I had those all full in my big gallons of black bags, so stuff like that. I'll make sure you have anything else. The other thing I would recommend, it's something called Travel Cubes. Um, a company called Eagle Creek makes them. There's also, like, Target has, like, a similar version of it, too. It's kind of like packing, packing in Ziploc bags, except when you pack in a Ziploc bag, Ziploc bag half time rips. So Ziploc bags are great for things like bringing back olive oil, but as far as, like, <laughs> keeping things organized in your suitcase, it's basically, these travel cubes are this little, like, mesh thing with a zipper around it. So you can have one cube that's for your socks and underwear, one cube that's for your t-shirts, and they have, like, ones that are this size, ones that are that size. I use them every time I travel. It really helps to compress and keep things organized in your bag so that you can bring less things because you know where everything is and you can actually access everything and it compresses it so that you can fit more into your bag which just means you have to watch as far as the weight allowance goes on but as far as fitting things in it can be great for that um, and one thing I would add and this is more directed towards the ladies than the guys um, typically in Europe at least when I was there they have major sales in January and July and so I took all these clothes and then ended up buying all of these clothes and so if you want to look up wherever you're going to see if that happens, um, it might be a way to lighten the load with regards to packing if you know that you might want to shop and you know, see what they have within the stores there. 
Sorry, yeah, sort of big really sales. big. <laughs> um, okay, so then we can go ahead and move on to transportation then. So transportation is pretty important. Um, you're going to want to do some research before you get there with regards to if you know you want to travel outside of the country that you're studying abroad or working or doing your internship in um, because every um, country kind of has its own system. Um, so with regards to trains, um, I never use the Europass Euro or Europass, but maybe you can kind of speak to that a little bit more. Um, but I will say that, you know, look up um, like times of trains online. Also do your research on prices because sometimes it might be more convenient um, to buy it online but it might be significantly cheaper to just buy it at the station. Um, so do that research but also kind of research do those normally sell out like should I just pay the extra money to know that you know I can secure my ticket um, that kind of stuff. Um, buses, trams, subways they function pretty much like every you know major city here in the US so you know talk to the locals see what bus you can use where it goes um, if what's the nearest stop to school or your internship or wherever you want to go normally they're all online as well um, I suggest looking into um, if you're going to be someplace for a significant amount of time excuse me um, getting like a three-month pass or a two-month pass or you know something like that because it typically is more uh, financially feasible or not financially feasible but more efficient and cheaper in the long run. Um, taxis, definitely be careful with this. Um, talk to people before you get into a taxi, make sure that it has a meter and make sure if it like doesn't have a meter depending on where you are but in Europe most of them should. Um, how much it should cost you to go to wherever you're going, especially when you're first getting to know the city or the town where you are. Um, just because, you know, I mean, typically you're a student, they know that, like, they can definitely take advantage of that. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so, I guess kind of like uh, Europe on the cheap, Ryanair and EasyJet, two really cheap airlines. But a couple things to think about this. Typically super bad flying time, so getting into places in the middle of the night, so you want to double check. And oftentimes they're kind of outside of the city, like half hour, hour or so. So make sure that you you know that there's a bus leaving there to get to the major city that you're going to and you're not just stuck in this random airport all night until the next morning bus. So double check when you're booking those flights. It might be the cheapest flight, but you might not be able to get a bus from that airport to the city for like six hours after your flight. So double check like those kind of things um, before you use them. Also, um, your carry-on baggage weight, they're pretty strict about these things. So make sure that you are not overpacking with regards to that. Also, this is where I would say Ziploc bags come in. Um, so they are a budget airline. Um, you're not gonna get the kind of uh, service that you would normally get on an airline. So I was traveling back from Paris one time and my bag sat on the runway for like a half hour and it was raining and it was soaking wet and everything in that bag was soaking wet. So this is when I learned the, to use the black bags to pack stuff, um, at least things that I don't want to get wet or don't want to have all my clothes wet. So that's a good use of Ziploc bags or other types of waterproof bags um, so you're not looking around wet clothes for a weekend. Mm -hmm. When, when she's saying that those are budget airlines, Ryanair had the idea of having, they, they, didn't, they didn't go through with this because of safety regulations, but they wanted to have standing room only options on their flights also, so you could pay even less and not have a seat. So that's the kind of budget airline we're talking, is that this is really bare bones, if anyone's flown Spirit Air here in the States, it can be similar to that, so lots of extra fees. It can be a great way to travel cheaply, just be aware of what you're booking. And the websites can kind of be deceiving because, as Mackenzie said, like they they do often fly into airports that are far mm -hmm. away from the city center. But on the website, it'll say like, "Oh, London to Rome." So you might think that, "Oh, I'm going to the main Rome airport," when in yeah. fact you're not. Well, so. and that's another thing to take into the cost of how much those bus those uh, bus tickets are from the major city to the airport because sometimes that makes the ticket more expensive than just flying out of the airport in the major city. So double check that stuff and you'll figure it out. If you do your research beforehand, you'll see how all of this works and you'll be able to, to do it. So. Um, so back to your rail passes. So I don't know if everyone's familiar with what your rail pass is. If you're traveling by train in Europe, you can either buy point to point tickets where you're buying a ticket from one destination directly to another, or before you go, you can buy what's called a Euro rail pass, um, which is going to allow you to travel for a certain number of days within a certain time period in a certain number of countries. So you can get with the global with the URL passes. You can get a global pass that covers the entire URL network. 
With those passes, you can do either flexible travel days, you can do 10 days within a two month period, or you can do 15 days of travel in a row. And what happens is individual trains might have a reservation fee, but other than that, you just go show your pass. If it's one of the flexi passes, you write your date of travel on the pass, and that counts as one day. So you can get a pass that covers the whole system, you can get passes that cover one country, regional passes that cover two countries, or select passes that cover three, four, or five bordering countries. Exactly how much you'll save and whether it's better to buy a pass or buy point-to-point -point tickets does depend on your specific trip, how many times you're planning on using the train, and what those specific train rides are. So it does take a little bit of research to know which is the best pass, and it can be a little bit confusing. So if people have more questions about what pass is best for the trip, I can definitely help with that. Do you have a question? Do you days? Like, do you ride multiple trains within that day? Does it count as one day? Right. It counts as one day. Okay. Where it gets, it's one calendar day. Yes. Where it gets confusing is when you get into night trains. Yeah. So night train, it's going to depend on exactly what time the train leaves and what time it gets into the new city, whether it counts as one day yeah. or two day. It's confusing, but if anyone's interested, I can explain that more later. Um, but in general, it's one calendar day. Start as night trains as you can. Um, right. So like that's like a like a great example is if you're in Italy, uh, Pisa is a great place to visit. You don't really need to spend that long of a time there. But let's say you're going from. Um, like going from Florence to Cinque Terre, Pisa is a great place to stop for an hour. Take the train there, stop off, go take your pictures, get back on the train, continue on. As long as that's still on the same calendar date, that counts as one day of travel, rather than buying a bunch of different point-to-point -point tickets. You also said there might be individual fees for certain trains. Mm -hmm. Some trains will have reservation fees. Um, Italy, actually, it's a place. Italy and Spain tend to have them. Um, other countries, it'll depend on the specific train. Night trains, there's always going to be some reservation fee. Exactly how much that costs depends on the specific train. So it can range from $10 for reservation fee, or if you're doing a night train, it's going to be more than that if you're doing, especially depending on which bedding options you're choosing. If you're choosing just a chair, it's going to be cheaper than if you're doing actual events. Yeah. So that's an additional to the... That would be additional, and that depends on the specific train. So right. that's, you buy the pass, and then once you're there, you make your reservations for the right. specific trains. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. Uh, are British Rail and Eurorail the same thing? They are not the same thing. Okay. Good question. So Eurorail does not cover the UK. So that would be BritRail would be the system there. They do have BritRail passes that you can get in conjunction with the Eurorail pass. If you're already getting the Eurorail pass, you don't have to pay the full price for the BritRail one. So there's different options for that as well. And getting between London and Paris, the channel, that's not Eurorail either. That's Eurostar. Those, the, you would buy a specific point-to-point -point ticket for that. And it's kind of like flights where it starts out at a lower price, and then once those cheaper prices sell out, then it keeps increasing. So that starts at like seventy dollars for a one way, but can go up to like three hundred dollars for a one way, depending on what the availability is. Mm -hmm. I have two more things to add to the topic of transportation. Since this again is Europe on the cheap, um, you might be tempted. So I guess I should start by saying that a lot of the the, the buses and trains and subways in Europe um, actually don't require you. Well, you can just get on them without having purchased a ticket. Right, so there aren't like necessarily turnstiles and things like that. You can just walk right in. It's kind of on the honor system. You don't want to do that because they will check once you're on the train or the the subway or the bus. Um, they, they will check to see whether or not you have a ticket. Sometimes they check all the time. Like for example, if you're taking a train, they will come through the train and check. But if you're taking a subway or just like a, a bus throughout the city, they're not going to check every single time. But when they do check you're going to want to have a ticket because you'll probably get yelled at possibly in a foreign language and there's going to be a fine involved. And sometimes the people who check for tickets are wearing street clothing. They're trying to be in disguise so that you don't know that, oh no, that, that's an officer. He's going to get up and check everyone's ticket. So just buy the ticket. It's pretty cheap. Um, it will save you uh, fines and embarrassment later on. Just, oh, sorry, oh, just a quick add on that. Um, more than once, embarrassingly, I've accidentally ridden illegally because you have a ticket, but you're supposed to have it validated in a machine or get it stamped to show the time. And so there's been oh, yeah. more than once where I've pulled out the ticket and been like, I have a ticket, and then, but I hadn't had it stamped. And so then you sometimes have to pay a fee sort of right on the spot. Mm -hmm. And that's something that guidebooks can be helpful with as yeah. far as how do you actually get the tickets and how do you validate it and what do you, what's the actual process. Same thing with your rail passes. If you don't validate your rear rail pass, then you're riding on the train illegally and you're going to get fined. And these fines, they can be 50 euros, 100 euros. These aren't like, here's your $10 fine. So definitely, be better to just buy the ticket. What do you mean by validate? Just go to an office before you ride and... And stamp it. Mm -hmm. 
or a machine, depending on. Yeah, the sometimes it's like in a machine that you just put it in and it does a timestamp. Sometimes it's a person, depending on yeah. if you're train or subway or what. But there's usually something that's going to have to be stamped onto the ticket. And then one final thing, sorry. <laughs> um, if you're kind of wondering, like, how, how much are trains? Like, just to get an idea of, like, what your budget could be, we, I put a, a website on the, the green agenda. It's um, bond.com. So it's actually the, the German Rails website. This is the English version, though. And it's really useful for planning out train travel, not necessarily in Germany, even. So you can just kind of get an idea of how much it might cost if you were to just do it individually. So. Now we can talk about hostels and hotels. Okay. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how people feel, but I love the sort of youth hostels um, when traveling in Europe. Um, they're cheap, they're fun, sort of it forces you to interact with people if that's not sort of your standard operating mode. Um, I would recommend that you definitely go online to either hostelworld.com, hostels.com. I've never used um, hostelbookers.com. And there's reviews. Um, you can uh, see sort of um, where things are located, how close they are to things you're interested in, um, see what other people think about them. Um, if you have any questions, I definitely recommend emailing hustles sort of directly. Every time I've done that, the people sort of get to know you very quickly and expect you and are excited to see you after you've sort of communicated with them ahead of time. Um, it's definitely the same exact same thing with sort of like Ryanair, is make sure you know like where the hostel is um, in comparison to the things that are going to be interesting to you. Um, I stayed in a hostel in Paris that was like two hours on the train outside of like anything that I wanted to do. I was like next to like um, French Walmart basically. And I, was, I wish I would have um, looked into it a little more ahead of time. Um, let's see. Yeah, definitely be careful with your belongings. Um, I always just make sure to separate things that are important. So sort of my passport and my credit passport, my credit card, and my money isn't all in the exact same place and just totally be devastated if, if all of those things were lost at the same time. Um, Mackenzie likes to sleep with her money and a belt. I'm really her. paranoid if I can't stay in a hostel that doesn't have a locker or that I can't purchase a locker and put, put all my stuff in there. I sleep with my passport. I sleep with the majority of my money like in at night. Like You might be sleeping in a dorm room with 12 other people. I'm sorry. I, I guess I have not that much faith in humanity, but <laughs> I've stayed in enough places, um, had enough things stolen over the years that I've just learned my lesson. So. And definitely um, bring a padlock ahead of time. Um, it's useful. There's usually lockers, but there's not necessarily usually um, locks to go with them. Um, I wanted to give an overview of like what a youth hostel is and how it might differ from a hotel, just okay. in case someone um, doesn't know. So every hostel I've stayed at has been different. Um, sometimes it's an apartment on the fifth floor of a random building um, in town. Sometimes it's really similar to a hotel. Um, usually what it is, is it's a place where you can stay um, with other people, basically. So there's either a dorm room or sometimes individual rooms. Um, so you might be sharing sort of like a bunk bed with another traveler. Um, there's always either a local or an expat that sort of works at the front desk most of the day and a lot of times through the night that you can talk to, they can give you directions, they can tell you sort of where to go, where not to go, and they're usually like really helpful with that stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of times hostels will have like a communal room, um, like they'll have like a kitchen, they might have like a room with like a TV or a library or a book swap. Um, so it's definitely, like you were saying, it's definitely a more social place to stay. Normally when you're staying in a hotel, you wouldn't walk up to someone else who's in another room and be like, hey, how's it going? And you kind of just are in your own bu bubble. In a hostel, everyone talks to each other, you find out what everyone else is doing, so you can get ideas for your trip too, or ideas like, hey, what did you do today? Oh, that sounds awesome, I'm gonna go do that tomorrow. Um, so it can definitely be a great way to travel, and if you're nervous about the dorm room thing, a lot of them do have private rooms. Mm -hmm. So the price that makes the pricing more similar to <laughs> hotels than to hostels. However, then if you're nervous about staying in dorm room with 12 other people, there also is the option to have a private room. Um, usually hostels will have mixed dorm rooms, sometimes they'll have a female dorm room also, some will have completely separate guys in one room, girls in another room, but just make sure you're aware of that, so if you're not comfortable staying together in the same room, just make sure you're booking the right type of dorm room. Mm -hmm. The fact that some of them have kitchens make it really great for budget travelers, so you can go to the market or go to the local grocery store and get some food items and, and actually cook for yourself while you're traveling, so that's a really good option if you're very budget conscious. 
I would also read the reviews. Yes. Um, I can kind of mention it. Sometimes you might like be on a budget, but after reading the reviews, like security might be an issue, or you know it's not very clean. It might be worth spending three or four extra dollars and staying in some place that's a little bit nicer. It might be a little bit closer to where you want to go. So even though you're on a budget, make sure that you are kind of reading those reviews and taking into consideration what type of hostel you're going to be staying at. You know what what do people say about it? That kind of stuff. Um, I tend to look for one that has someone on duty at all times that they lock the front door after. A certain time um, you know see if they have sheets you might show up and not have anything to sleep on others so you you know make sure that they either provide sheets you can rent sheets like whatever um, I normally try to look for ones that have a locker but you know sometimes you don't I typically like to stay in all female dorm rooms if I have to stay in a dorm um, so just you know figure out what's important to you with regards to kind of like where you're staying and what what you're looking for in that and just keep in mind that you're getting what you're paying for. Yeah. So when you're spending $30 for a bed and dorm room for a night, it can be a great $30 worth of bed. However, you're only spending $30. Just adjust your expectations. You're not staying in a hotel. There's not going to be that same level of customer service or amenities that you would have in a hotel. So just keep in mind that you're getting what you're paying for a lot of times with all of these budget things. And especially in Western Europe and some of the really big touristy cities like London, Rome, Paris. Um, some hostels can be expensive. Um, they might not be like the 13, 14 euros a night. And in that case, sometimes, especially if you're with a couple other people, it can be cheaper to find a really cheap hotel and share a room. Um, so it's good to sort of look at the two and compare. Um, and another thing, if you are staying in a hostel, make sure you tell them ahead of time when you're going to arrive. Um, in Barcelona, uh, this happened to me. I got to the hostel and there was no one there. Um, and like three hours later, the guy walked in. He's like, "Oh, hey, what's up?" And so you, you don't want that to happen to you. You want to be able to, you know, get out and go start doing stuff when you get there. You don't want to wait around. Speaking of, sorry. Speaking of timing, um, sometimes hostels have curfews. So that's another thing that you would find out on like one of these hostel booking websites or like through STA if you book through STA. Um, if there's a curfew, that means that you're going to obviously want to be back in the, the hostel by 11 p.m. So if you're a night owl, you want to go to the clubs all night or something like that, don't book a hostel with a curfew because you will be spending the night out on the street, and that's not safe. Some hostels also have lockout hours during the day, so that might be from like 11 to 2 tends to be like a popular time for lockout hours, and that's usually times when they're cleaning or um, maintenance of the hostel, so that means that no one's allowed in the hostel during the day. So if you're booking a hostel and you're just arriving from an international flight and you want to be able to just sleep all day, again, that wouldn't be the right one to book. So just make sure you know what you're booking. Uh, two quick things. One, I guess, to packing in hostels is I really like having a like a large quick dry towel that I just have with me all times. And that way, like, there's been too many times where I've been sort of worried if there's going to be a towel or, I don't know, it's sort of like this. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the towel's like everything, and that's like a real thing. So, um, and the other thing is if you're sort of like on the edge about do I want to do hostels or not, I would say try it. It's definitely, I know people that didn't do hostels, didn't do hostels, and then they did it, I feel like they missed out on a lot of really cool opportunities. So. And there's lots of very different hostels. There are hostels that are definitely sketchier than others. There are hostels that are super nice, such friendly staff, great amenities like even though they might be cheaper there still are definitely wonderful hostels out there just keep in mind there's also the sketchy ones <laughs> one last packing can bring flip-flops for the shower oh, you're yeah. gonna want that badly <laughs> okay. um anything else okay um so then i guess just some extra things for oh go ahead i was wondering do you need to book hostels pretty far in advance do they fill up especially in the summer um, I would say that depends on where you're going, like the location of it, if there's like a festival or something like, so this is a really bad travel story. So my friends and I went to Tunisia, we got back, we had like four days left in Spain and we're like, oh, let's just go to Valencia for three days or whatever. Rode down to Valencia on the train, we're like, we'll just find a hostel when we get there. We get in at like 11 o'clock. We did not know there was a big festival going on, so literally like <laughs> slept on the park benches, like had no place to stay, like ended up finding something the next day. So. Do your research on where you're going and what you're doing, and if there is something going on, I would say book as early as possible. If not, you're probably, I would still book something, but you're probably okay to like do a last minute trip. It also depends on how picky you are and where you're staying, and if you're looking for 
the if it's just that you need whatever is the least expensive place or you're looking for a specific hostel that has a good reputation, these places definitely fill up, even not during high season. Like I my first time backpacking Europe was in the fall, wasn't busy at all, but when I would get to the major cities, then it was harder to find accommodations because there's lots of people there, even if it's not during the high season. Um, if you're open to staying wherever and your budget is flexible, then you can definitely wait to book things. However, it's possible that you get somewhere and there's nowhere to stay and you're either spending a lot for a hotel or sleeping on a park bench. One quick thing regarding timing. Um, we are approaching one. We have about 10 minutes left, but we have more content. So we are actually going to keep going. We're probably going to run over a little bit. If you do need to go to class, please feel free to exit at 1. Uh, we're, we're videotaping it, and we do plan to put this on YouTube, so you can always catch it later if you need to. But, all right, go ahead. All right, so just like some extra things while you're traveling around while you're there. Um, these are going to be places where your guidebooks or, you know, research beforehand is going to come in handy um like things like you know maybe a museum is randomly closed on Thursdays for some reason or um, like a, one thing I picked up from a guidebook was the Vatican on Wednesdays the Pope gives his address in the square so the museums are really empty so that's a really good time to go um, one a good way to get around and see a city can be in a lot of the big European cities they have bikes that you can rent. Um, you just like walk up and rent them. Um, and you can ride them around. That can be a really great way to see a lot of things. They're really cheap. Um, and that's different. Um, try to do things, you know, see the big touristy things, but try to do things that the locals do, like asking you know, people in hostels or people in stores, like, what are your favorite restaurants? Where are some cool places to go? Like, what are the fun things to do at night? That's not only a good way to sort of get more of a local point of view, but also that's a little safer than just showing up at a random nightclub that you might not know anything about. Um, so yeah, just do your research beforehand and be conscious while you're there. Um, and then I guess if no one has anything else to say on that, we can go ahead and do communication. Do communication, um, much easier than most other parts of the world. Like, I'm going to say the majority of places you're going to go, you're going to find wireless internet. Um, your, there are internet cafes if you don't have wireless internet. Um, so, obviously, you know, all the internet forms of communication, Facebook, email, Skype, uh, Google Talk, all that kind of stuff. Um, cell phones, um, I'm not sure exactly how Europe works with regards to if you have to, like, purchase if there's SIM cards over there that you can just purchase for each country and you can just pop it in. Make sure if you have like an iPhone, smartphone, whatever kind of phone, it's unlocked so that you can use it over there. So you just pop your SIM card out from the States and pop, you know, buy whatever's over there. Um, one iPhone app that I really recommend, and I'm not sure if it's on like the Android or whatever, is Viber. Um, it's kind of like Skype, except if you have internet or like data or anything like that, you can still use it. So my best friend lives in Switzerland and like we text all day for free. Um, over Viber, we can call each other for free. Like it costs us nothing. It's just like an an app. It works like Skype, except I don't have to be at my computer um, or be connected to the internet. It just works over um, kind of the uh, like cell phone connection kind of thing. Um, so that's a really good um, way to keep in touch with people um, and that kind of stuff. So I don't know if other people um, have. If you don't have an iPhone, WhatsApp. Um, APP is one that works on Blackberries, and I assume for them probably on other non-iPhone phones. IPhone. Mm -hmm. If you have an iPhone or a smartphone, um, you really need to also think about like data fees. So if, if you go over to Europe and you have your phone on as you normally would here, you are going to rack up insane charges for using your phone, like thousands of dollars, like very quickly. So. You probably, unless you have some sort of special plan through your provider through which you're able to um, use your phone internationally, you're probably going to want to turn off your data when you go abroad. And then um, possibly, you know, purchase like a, a, a really cheap cell phone if you're going to be over in Europe for a while. Um, gosh, I think you can get them for like, what, like $30 or 30 euros or something like that. I mean, I know, I don't know other ones. I know SDA, we have mm -hmm. global cell phones starting at $29. Yeah. So, and then you could use that your whole trip and put in a new SIM card if you wanted. Um, but um, if you're, you are using your iPhone, then you can also use that. So you could use the two of them. So if you have like 
for if you're using a prepaid cell phone, the per minute rate is going to be a little bit more expensive, so it's not going to be great for your long conversations home. For that, it's better to use either a calling card or if you have a smartphone, if you, uh, like with iPhone, if you keep it on airplane mode and turn on your Wi-Fi, then you can pick up free Wi-Fi and use things like Viber or Skype to make your longer calls that way, but then have a global cell phone as your backup so you have a phone with you all the time in case of emergency so you can call or for the quick phone calls or texts like, hey, where are you so we can meet kind of thing. Calling cards you can get in like newspaper stands, um, tobacco stores. I know that's true in Spain. I don't know if it's true everywhere. And another thing about the tobacco stores is that's really the only place, at least in Spain, that you could buy stamps. Um, I like traveled all over the city trying to find stamps and it turned out that they were in the tobacco stores. So that's where those are if you find that you need them. Um, Okay, and then so finances abroad. Um, before you leave, call your bank, your credit card companies, um, all of them, and tell them where you're going to be and when you're going to be there because if you don't, they will freeze your cards in your accounts. Um, and you do not want that to happen. So that should be the first thing that you do. Um, also make photocopies of all of your credit cards. Leave one at home, bring one with you. So if you know one gets lost or stolen, you have the card number, um, phone numbers to call the company, all of that stuff with you. Um, using debit cards and credit cards are typically the easiest thing, way to get money abroad. Um, they have ATMs all over like we do here. The thing to keep in mind though is that in addition to like if you were to use an ATM here that's not your bank, there will be a service fee, there's going to be that and there can in addition then be an international fee. Um, so that's something you should check with your bank and your credit card company. Yeah. Do you know about how much like, it would be? Um, it's really like five dollars, yeah. I think, like with your service fee and the international yeah. fee. TCF, I think every time you went to an ATM, it was a five dollar charge and then three percent of however much you were mm -hmm. drawing. So it's a wow. little cheaper to withdraw more at one time than to go like every day and take out 20 euros. That's not going to be the most effective way. Yeah, international wire um, bank transfers and foreign currencies, do you know of any places or just banks from U of M or from the... For wiring there? money? Yeah, for international currency. I mean, I think we typically don't recommend mm -hmm. wiring money. Okay. It's best to take out some amount of the currency of the place that you're going to here so you can arrive with it. Like, don't bring, like, 600 euros with you, but, like, a couple hundred for when you arrive is usually a good idea. What? You can do that locally at, um, in Nichols Arcade. There's a travel agency called uh, Borisma Travel. And if you would like to bring over like 60 euros or something mm -hmm. like that, just so you have some money to get a taxi mm -hmm. or to get settled, um, you can do that there. Um, in instead of wearing money, one thing I did is sort of got an extra copy of like, a debit card and leave it with like a friend or your mom or someone who can then put money into your account. Mm -hmm. And that's easier than wearing. Mm -hmm. but, but if you have to use it before you go, to, so if an uh, organization needs money for wiring and money to them, what would you suggest? Talk to your bank. Talk yeah. to your bank. Start, start with your bank and see what they can do for you, because usually if you have an account with a bank, they're usually more helpful with things like exchanging. So that would be the best starting place to see what they charge for that. And make sure it's not a scam, because yeah. we've heard yeah. many horror stories of people who are looking for housing for the summer in, in Paris, and oh shoot, they accidentally sent 500 euros to a scam artist. So be careful. So if you were to go to an ATM and like swap money, would it give you it like even if you put like it would give you it back in euros? Right. Right. So, so it would transfer transfer it for you. Some like, ATMs will have an option where yeah. you can choose whether you're getting euros or dollars or whatever the currency is yeah. 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 And keep in mind that not all of Europe is on the euro. Yeah. So definitely if you're traveling around, make sure that you know what currency is in the country you're going to. And if you're leaving a country and not going back to the place that has that currency anymore, any change you have, make sure you change that in the country. Because mm -hmm. coins or like anything like less than a dollar, they won't change outside of that country. And the coins can be substantial amounts of money in other countries. It's not just that we're talking like 50 cents here. You can have like $5 coins. They are then not going to be able to change over once you leave that country. Um, I have a couple of things. One, I always just took out the maximum amount that I could take out. Um, so then it was like, it would be all my money for a month and I was only getting charged once. Um, it depends on where, what your living situation is, how comfortable you feel having that much money someplace, whatever. Um, also, um, Charles Schwab, if you open a bank account with them and have a debit account, they reimburse you for all international fees. Um, so that's 
something to look into if you're looking to get a bank account or something like that. Um, it's a great way to do that. Um, and for budgeting, since it's kind of Europe on the cheap, um, whenever I go someplace, I'm not that great about thinking about things and how much they cost in euros versus dollars. And so I typically, my first couple of weeks, like have a little journal or notepad and I like write down everything that I'm buying, even if it's like a candy bar on the street or, you know, my bus ticket or whatever, I write it down and so that I can kind of see like how much I'm spending in euros, like in dollars, so that I get an idea of like how things cost and what I'm spending per day and what it should look like and that kind of thing. So it's kind of cheesy and a little like OCD, but it helps me understand my budget in another currency and like what things cost. I think in terms of like candy bars, so like, like yeah. how many Snickers is this? <laughs> yeah. What would you guys say about traveler's checks? No. 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 Traveler's checks used to be great. Yeah. Now, most places aren't going to accept them. And if they do accept them, they're going to charge you a huge fee. Yeah. And they're cost, they cost money to get mm -hmm. originally. And they're going to charge you a fee and give you a worse exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And not accept them everywhere. So if you already have it, bring it with you, it's money, some place will be able to exchange it for you. If you're deciding whether or not to get traveler's checks, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, and then, so like McKenzie was saying, it does add up, you know, when you're taking things out in euros and you're not thinking in euros. Um, so it's a good idea to keep the exchange rate in mind because it might change while you're there. While I was abroad, it hovered anywhere from, you know, 1.2 to 1.4, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. So just make sure to keep that in mind while you're abroad. All right. Um, so then I guess we can move on to health and safety. Um. Yeah, I, I think I talked a little bit about this. I like just to separate sort of the important things so I know all in one place. Um, and I definitely do use sort of, what is it called? Like the wallet that hangs around your neck and goes under your clothes that that works. Um, and definitely when you're in Europe and, and anywhere, and actually if you're in Eastern Europe, it's even more so. I guess dress a little better than you might hear. Um, it's really weird walking into a restaurant or even just a store and everyone else is sort of dressed better than you. You stand out very, very quickly. Um, uh, and we have here the same groups, but I would also say not huge groups. Um, that tends to attract more attention than even if you're just by yourself. I don't know what you want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it, and I think the groups thing goes more for females. Don't walk anywhere by yourself, even during the day, unless you like really absolutely have to, or you're in a city center that you know really well. Um, you know, really try to be with someone else, whether that's a male or another female. Um, you know, it's just kind of common sense at this point. Um, you wouldn't be in New York unless you live there, walking around at night by yourself. Hopefully, you take a cab or whatever. Um, and males, be respectful. Like, try to walk a lady home if she needs to. It sounds old-fashioned, but just more so for their safety. Um, and taking care of friends and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah. Um, if you are planning a solo trip as a female, it's definitely still possible to yeah. do, or not saying that. Just when there's the opportunity to then be with other people rather than being on your own, then sometimes that can be helpful for safety. But I mean, I've spent many times traveling by myself. I spent a few months backpacking on my own throughout Europe and was totally fine. So it's definitely possible to do a solo trip as a female, just you have to be aware of what's going on and when there's the opportunity to be with other people, I'll take those. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but definitely the more language you know, the safer you tend to be in situations, and sort of the more respect you have from people and things like that. So always, I mean, even if you're just traveling for a little bit, always spend some time on language. That's another thing that guidebooks are good for because typically in the back they'll have like a little translation so you have numbers or thank you or you know just short phrases even if you can't pronounce it you can always point to it and like have some form of communication if you're stuck in a situation where you can't communicate. And there are also some great translator apps for yeah. iPhone and Android that can do the same thing. I've had entire conversations with people where we are either on an app or on a computer literally just typing and clicking translate because neither of us spoke the same language. So those can definitely be a great way to communicate with people if needed. I think it's just common sense and being, you know, super aware, more aware than you usually are, you know. If you need to stop and ask for directions, maybe don't ask a random person on the street going to a store. Um, if you're getting on a bus, don't sit next to a strange man. Like, it's just be aware of your surroundings. If you wouldn't do it here, don't do it there. Um, and then we can do our last one, which is language barriers and culture shock. Yeah, um, so we kind of talked about the language barrier, lots of opportunities to 
find ways to translate or to communicate, even if you guys don't speak the same language. Um, cultural sensitivity, pretty big thing, I think. Um, you know, you don't want to stand out any more than you are you're going to. Um, so, you know, like we were talking about earlier, if you are going to visit a lot of churches and stuff, either bring a scarf or bring a sweater that you carry in your bag and you just put on when you're going into the churches. Um, you know, I guess try to be respectful of the way that, um, you know, people are dressing. Um, if they're dressing in long skirts or skirts down to their knee, you know, don't be wearing your really short shorts that you might be wearing here. Um, try to be more respectful of how they dress and integrate yourself into the culture. That's going to give you a much, you know, more authentic experience and you're just going to have an easier time. You're not going to be harassed by people on the streets, um, vendors, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so that goes, plays into kind of the respect thing, respecting the community that you're in. Um, you know, you, I would hope that you're respectful of the community you're living in now and so, you know, carry that over there too. Um, culture shock. Things are just different. Um, you know, if you're a picky eater, prepare yourself that you might not, you know, be able to get peanut butter or whatever. I mean, I think that that's accessible in most places, but um, I don't know. I think it, if it's your first time traveling outside of the U.S., there is going to be a sense of culture shock. Also, kind of just like when you first came to college or whatever, like you have emotional roller coasters, highs, lows, meeting new friends, meeting new people, new experiences. Put yourself out there. Push yourself beyond the limits that you think that you know you're capable of you're gonna have a really you know things might be great and things might not be bad it might be bad but at least you'll have that experience and you'll get to know yourself a little bit better due to the experience you can just be as considerate as you can um, not everybody lives the way we do um, like in, in Spain for example electricity water is so expensive so you can't take 15 minute showers if you do that people will be really upset um, they don't use lights during the day you use sunlight, um, so just be considerate. Do as you see the locals doing is usually the best rule.